Welcome to the Woodsmith or the Shop Notes podcast. Wow. There you go. I'm your host, Phil Huber. Today on a special spring break episode, we're joined by design editor Dylan Baker and Logan Whitmer, as always. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is episode number 187. Wow. 187. Little word from our sponsor. You want a glue that you can trust, and fortunately, Tightbond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp time to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance, look to Tightbond, the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com. All right, before we dive into the fascinating topics that we have lined up for today's episode we'll go through a couple of comments from the last last episode uh which was when we were doing a little update on logan's dust collector setup and then also talking about pricing your work when you're when you're not a professional new mexico dan says as a retiree i have said i don't do anything for money as if i was trying to make money i would go broke However, in December, a lady whose father had been a woodworker had passed away and was making a pair of nightstands that he hadn't finished. Woodsmith, bedroom set, oak nightstand, blah, blah, blah. So I volunteered. It's taking me a while to do as I'm not fond of the style, but more fond of the Woodsmith cherry bedside table that I built. Yeah, I can see that. Fortunately, he had bought all the wood and prepared most of it. It's taking longer than I expected, but this is free work. Um... I'm not even going to try that handle. The pricing question always seems to be a tough one to consider. There are so many factors that go into it beyond just cost in your local area. I'm a hobbyist and enjoy the craft on the side. It's not a job for me. So the amount I could charge would vary wildly from the side hustle people or the making a living people. It's a question that seems to come up for every YouTube woodworking channel, but most of the channels are either getting out of doing custom work or were hobbyists to begin with. There you go. So that brings up a question then, Dylan, because I was talking about um, getting a commission to do a couple of uh, large built-ins for some friends of mine. They're still going to pay me for it. It's just like figuring out what that price is. Mm-hmm. when it's not your job. Yeah. And I'm not trying to live off of it necessarily. This is more of a send my kid to college kind of project. <laughs> but also is, knowing Are your are your kids in the shop working on it? <laughs> <laughs> this but, is more a Phil needs a new hand plane project. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean there's that too. Uh So the question that I would have for you then is you've done this professionally prior to coming to Woodsmith and you still do some stuff on the side is what's, what's some of the calculus that you run for pricing a job? Um, it is difficult. And to be honest, it's something I I still kind of struggle with. Um, and you know, it having as many variables as it does, it's, you know, I'm in a position where it's nice where I don't necessarily have to, I'm not making a living, but I still charge, you know, pricing now what I would charge if I were doing it full time. I'd I'd have to because alluding to one of the uh, comments that you made from somebody that was a listener is that you would essentially go broke if you didn't otherwise. And I, they're, 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 it's tough, too, because there's a huge disconnect because there's the people like us that make stuff and then there's the people you're doing it for. And um they have their own kind of perceptions of like what's expensive as we do too. Um, and so I think there's always definitely sticker shock with things because materials are just short of again, like Logan has a sawmill, which is great. So if you really want to cut costs out substantially, you essentially have to have to mill your own lumber because the (laughs) the, the price of material is so exponentially high. Um, and then then you're not going to save much. (laughs) Yeah. You're really not going to save much. And you know, it's not just material and it's not just labor. You have all of the the tools that are involved too. You know, you break a saw blade, you know, you're out a hundred bucks and you got to take a trip to the store. And so how do you, 
how do you uh, calculate that into your cost or do you? Um, but, you know, if right. you're not think, thinking about all these variables, you inevitably will realize that you're not making any money at all, which, you know, creates its own problems. And so um, there's also the the aspect of um, pricing work, too, is, you know, if you're doing multiples of something small, like I've charged all maybe charged per item or um, just charged as a whole project. Um, if it's a bigger project, I, I'll usually charge by the hour. And so there's always those contingencies as well. And so it's kind of the case by case basis. If they're family friends and it's material I have laying around, I know it's not going to take that long. Sometimes I don't charge people at all. And so, but that's also just kind of a luxury that I have, but right. um, it is an ongoing kind of moral dilemma with, you know, you want to take on work. And if you're somebody that wants to make a living doing it, you have to charge certain prices to not only make it worthwhile, but have it be a successful livelihood for yourself. And so um, I know that's a very long answer and probably could continue to talk about it for a while. But um, yeah, I think it's a, a lot of just kind of trial and error. And um, it's like woodworking, you have to just do it to become more comfortable with doing it and uh, get the experience. And then based off that experience, you can make those sorts of judgment calls. So, um, yeah. but I think again, over time I've gotten better about it. I mean, there's some things where I'm like, ah, I probably should have charged a little bit more, but would have really made much of a difference to me. I mean, what's a hundred dollars here, a hundred dollars there. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. I think uh, you make a good point about uh, doing it more often because I think, especially in my case, is just the unfamiliarity with asking somebody a certain amount of money where it just is a little eye watering for me because, you know, like I said, I can't afford me and mm -hmm. to be able to keep a straight face and to look at somebody and say, this is $5,000, mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and be like, no, that's really what it is. That's what it's going to be to take care of this. So, Knowing, knowing your clientele too. I mean, there's people that you deal with that, you know, that are used to writing those checks, um, you know, dealing with people in the restaurant industry or there are people that are trying to, whether it's start a new restaurant or, um, build something out for a new one. I mean, those are people that are just, they have their own sort of experience with what things cost. And so they're, they're used to a certain line of pricing or, um, and a lot of times too, with commercial work, I will, you know, basically ask them, you know, like what, what sort of pricing are you getting? Cause again, I'm in a position where it's like, well, I can be competitive too. It's not that I'm trying to undercut somebody, but right. I want, I want to make it worth my while. And if there's somebody I know, I want to be able to, again, accommodate them. So, uh, I guess that just kind of goes back to the case by case thing. Right. No, that's true. Cool. Thanks. So Logan, a few weeks ago, you put uh, urethane tires on your 36-inch <laughs> bandsaw. Yeah, you want me to go grab one quick so people can see what the 36-inch tire looks like? Yes. Were they the were the urethane ones? Yeah, the urethane ones are the ones he tried to put on. He's putting rubber ones on, or did right. yesterday. So this, this for everybody watching on the YouTubes, is one 36-inch. <laughs> urethane bandsaw tire like new with, with a big old gouge taken out of it oh good golly yeah so i think i think that's what you're alluding to phil yes is what the hell happened <laughs> right because you were so, yeah. talking about upgrading and getting this bandsaw running yeah so i was i was telling i think i was telling dylan or i was telling somebody yesterday when they were here uh we were filming here um so urethane has kind of been the new standard for bandsaw tires for the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years or so. Um, before then, it was rubber tires. Before that, it was vulcanized tires. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was wooden tires on bandsaws. Um, because I know everybody came here for the history of bandsaw tires. Right. Um, and the thing with, with these, with urethane tires, is you do not glue them on. Okay. They get, they're a stretch fit. So you put them in hot water, maybe a little dish soap in it, let them heat up and kind of get a little bit more malleable. You stretch them on, they're good. Now, as 
it's cool if you ever <laughs> i don't suggest doing this but if you open your bandsaw as it's running you can see the tire as it is the centrifugal force is actually pulling that tire slightly off the wheel on the bottom of the arc or the top of the arc on the bottom of the tire right so centrifugal force is actually making this thing stretch out and and kind of ride off the tire a little bit um but the urethane's stretchy enough that it, it usually snaps back on unless you have a 36 inch bandsaw that's running at 5,000 feet per minute um so standard bandsaws like a 14 inch bandsaw generally will run at about 3,500 feet linear feet per minute blade speed this 36 inch even though the motor is much slower it's 570 rpm for the motor the blade speed itself is 500 or 5,600 feet per minute so it's very very fast Mm -hmm. wow i think so i got this bands all set up running i was having problems with the blade like the blade wanted to kind of walk back and forth just a little bit enough that it was annoying me right and so I, I opened up the lower guard to see how it was riding on that lower wheel. And the, the t- this tire was bunched up, wrapped around the axle like this. And the blade <laughs> itself was f- under full tension riding on the steel tire or steel wheel. Okay. So not a standard uh, operation. Not, not, <laughs> not the standard operating procedure. Now, I have not reached out. So I bought these, these urethane tires from a company called Sulphur Tools. Um, I haven't reached out to them to say, hey. This happened, you know, I spent 210 bucks on these pair of tires. You know, this happened. What's going on? I haven't reached out to them. I just ordered new rubber tires for it from Carter um, Mm -hmm. up in Michigan. And the the rubber tires you glue on, um, they have they have stretch, but they don't retract back to their shape. So, like, you have to glue them on because the centrifugal force would stretch them enough that they would fly off. So, sure. yep. So I was yesterday hoping I filmed a little bit on some of the updated electrical on that bandsaw because I have the original start and stop button working on it. I have the VFD controlling the bandsaw is now in an electronics enclosure mounted to the bandsaw. So it's just, oh, it's that's a cool. self-contained unit. So there's just a plug now that you plug yeah. in. Um, new flex conduit on everything looks nice and shiny. Uh, I had planned on yesterday putting on that new rubber. However, <laughs> after opening the box and reading the instructions, it's like scuff sand the inside of the bandsaw tire, scuff sand the wheel, yeah. uh, mix epoxy, apply epoxy, stretch rubber. And I'm like, mm, that sounds like a lot of work to do on a Wednesday afternoon when I have a magazine issue due the next day <laughs> and and a class to teach that night. So I did not do any of that. <laughs> I have the I have the new tires, I have the epoxy, I have everything ready to go. I just need our crew to come back up because my video I said now let's step over to the bench and glue these tires on, so I can't just not do it on video. Is that <laughs> right. goofy? So, um, yeah. So, best laid plans of mice and men. Now I might be missing something. Um, I, you know, maybe it's like, hey, you need to you know rotate those tires inside out and then they'll stay on. I. I don't know. There might be something stupid like that that I'm missing. Um, yeah. I just have never had that issue, but I've no- also never owned a 36-inch bandsaw like this. Yeah. So, I, awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I, I wish I wish that when Dylan was out here yesterday that I had a blade in it thing because the thing is, it is something to behold. Like, yeah, I'm sure. It is such a cool saw when it's up and running. It really makes me – so I have a second bandsaw in here. It's a Powermatic 15-inch really makes me want a 42 inch bandsaw oh brother because <laughs> it would be amazing especially if you got one of them so uh tanowitz and crescent both so tanowitz still makes bandsaws but mm-hmm. um crescent and tanowitz back in the day in the you know 30s 40s 50s made bandsaws that not only the table did not tilt the entire neck laid down oh which yeah would be wow. really sweet god that would be so cool It'd be like a state fair ride looking thing it would yeah it would oh it'd be unbelievable the problem is you get to the 42 inch size and this is why i didn't buy so i was looking at a 42 inch tanowitz before i bought this crescent and actually the 42 inch tanowitz was cheaper um i actually i got a hold of um matt 
Matt Cremona up in Minneapolis because I, I I called him. And he was like, hey, tell me about because I know he has he has a forty two inch Danowitz, but tell me about it. He's like, got it four years ago. I haven't touched it. I'm like, okay, cool. That's not what I wanted to hear. Yeah, <laughs> but perfect. Those forty two inch saws need the lower tire recessed in the concrete because the tire sits below the frame of the oh. saw. Wow. So I got in floor heat. It's really hard to cut out the concrete. Yeah. Um, so then at that point, it's like you put it on blocking, but then you're cutting at chest height, which is a yeah. little weird. So. You just have to make like a little stage that you stand up on. That's I right. Guess. Yeah. The bandsaw stage. Woodworking stilts. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Platform shoes. It could just be an outdoor bandsaw if that were the case. Could be. <laughs> which is probably sure where you would use it. I'm sure my wife and neighbors would love that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Although I did see, I did see, um, I think I was telling, I don't know if I was telling Dylan, if I was telling you this, or if I was telling John, maybe I was telling Mark, uh, there, ah, I was thinking I was telling my buddy Bobby. Um, there was this identical bandsaw for sale in Des Moines. Uh, oh, yeah. A month ago, but it had been sitting outside for a long time. Like it was oh. rusty. Yeah. And I think the guy wanted 500 bucks for it. And, to me, I'm like, you know, I could probably buy that, scrap everything on it except the wheels. Because oh. those wheels and axles would make the great foundation for a giant bandsaw mill. Mm. Okay. Because they're two inch wide. Yeah. I mean, buying new wheels from like Cook is like $900 per wheel from Cook Sawmills. Yeah. I'm like... The only thing that it's lacking is because they're spoked. They don't have the mass and momentum. Oh. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. most, most big bandsaw wheels like that will be solid because then they have mass and momentum. And, you know, it's like if a you're, flywheel, if, kind of. It's like a flywheel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But with these being spoked, you know, each one of those steel tire wheels on that thing are, like, 15 pounds. They're not heavy at all. Hmm. So, yeah. But, you know, I just... So did the bandsaw sell? Do you know? I don't know. I haven't seen it pop back up, so I'm assuming somebody grabbed it. Yeah. So I'm like, or the guy, it, or the, or nobody bought it, and he's the guy's like, you know what, scrap it. Yeah, that's yeah, it's yard art. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yard yeah. art. Yeah. I have those. They just happen to be logs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got quite the production going on out there now. So, Although yeah, I wouldn't even call it a production. It's like a shit show. <laughs> I, I definitely support the decision to have a, a sawmill, a, a vertical bandsaw mill in your new building where Ooh, that would be Bailey cool. Park like just, yeah. Put logs on and just run it through. Just get a, just get the biggest like industrial planer you can get and then get a, a bandsaw mill out there. And then you got, yep. you can mill all winter, baby. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, that's on, that's unconditioned out there. She'd still be a little cold. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. Turbo, a couple turbo diesel heaters. There you no go. Problems. Yep. All set. Good venting. Mm-hmm. He's got to blow it into the trees. Right. Right. Now, speaking of sawmilling, because we haven't had a sawmilling update from you in a while, uh, one of our longtime listeners who goes by the handle Puppy Doc uh, mm-hmm. came by for a tour, I don't know, a year ago, year and a half, something like that, mm-hmm. we'll call it. Uh, he's coming for a visit, which I suggest to anybody who wants to come down, but he made yep. special arrangements or up, come up or up wherever, which, yeah. whichever geographical location you need to travel to in order to find us. Yeah. You don't have to drive to Minneapolis then, then down, down. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Right. Yeah. And that would still be downhill because that's, uh, yeah, it's down, down the earth. earth. Yeah. Down the elevation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Mileage. Anyway, he made some special arrangements. He's coming for a new tour just to see what's going on here because there's always something different. And then is going to uh, spend a day or two with you milling, right? Yeah, yeah. As long as I have, as long as I have sharp blades. <laughs> I told I was talking to uh, Bob is his name, so I was talking to Bob, and I was like, I better look and see if I got some sharp blades. I think I do. If I don't, I'm going to be sitting there with a Dremel for about 20 minutes to get a sharp blade. <laughs> there you go. But that's part of it, so, though, too. Is it is, yeah. I mean, basically, like, hey, you want the entire experience, sharpen this blade. 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. Apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> That is part of the immersive process. Yeah. Right. That or you can give him some uh, VR goggles while you sharpen mm-hmm. the blade so he can kind of pretend like he's saw milling. Yeah. <laughs> little word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Tightbond. You want a glue that you can trust. And fortunately, Tightbond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp time to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance, look to Tightbond the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com. Just oh. say that it's better that he got the Dremel instead of just the chainsaw file. file. To... Oh, God, that'd be miserable. <laughs> so miserable. I don't know what would be worse, the actual filing or the moving it six inches at a time in a bench vise so the blade doesn't <laughs> right. rattle. <laughs> yeah, Can't you those... just, just file it on the saw, right? Or on the mill? Probably. Yeah. Might be able to. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, good thing those blades are inexpensive. Yeah. Because who really wants to sharpen those? <laughs> yeah. Well, so my, my buddy Bob, um, that has a sawmill down the road for me, and it's where I send all my stuff to be kiln dried, he bought a sharpener. So there's mm. many, many companies that make bandsaw mill blade sharpeners. Um, I don't know that they can do like regular blades. I've never seen one that had a small enough wheel to do like a, a standard bandsaw blade. Um, and that wouldn't, I don't think be worth sharpening anyways. Um, but his is a semi-automated one. It's from Woodmiser. Um, hmm. it, semi-automated. It is automated. You, you set it up and it uses diamond wheels. And I ordered, I ordered the diamond wheels that match my blades for his sharpener. So we just set it up in there. There's a big oil bath, and it sprays freaking oil all over. You open that thing up, it's just spraying oil. <laughs> um, but it grinds the blades, and it just it has a little paw that just pushes the blade one tooth at a time. And mm. then the grinder just rides on a little cam up and down and just bzz, bzz. And I think when I go to Bob's, we can do an entire box of ten blades of mine in maybe an hour and a half. Oh, that's oh, great. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. And I mean... Yeah, I can order a new box of blades for 250 bucks shipped, um, which would be 10 blades. Uh, these actually cut better than oh. a new blade. Oh, that's yeah. worth knowing. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. And you can sharpen about three times. Depends on how heavy you hit the, the tooth because mm-hmm. you're grinding the gullet and then the top of the tooth um, because mm. you're, you have to take out some of that gullet material because that's yeah. where stress fractures get um but every grind you do you're reducing a little bit of the tooth set so you can get about three depending on how hard you hit them you can get three or four sharpenings per blade before you have to reset the teeth and bob did buy the automatic tooth setter also but we haven't even set it up i mean he's in it for a year and a half now and we just keep sharpening our blades and using them so yeah like, can you ch- can you change the pitch on the teeth you could yeah you'd be grinding off a lot of metal That'd be the biggest thing Okay, to change the pitch because uh, I use 7 degrees or 10 degrees. Um, I haven't noticed a big difference between how the two cut on my, my sawmill. Hmm. Uh, but there's four sevens, tens. He, have a, he has a 747, which is the um, Woodmiser, like a proprietary tooth pattern. Um, so so he, has a, he has a bunch of different wheels. Um and stuff, and you could change the pitch, but you'd be regrinding a bunch of metal, and at that point, it's not even worth it. Yeah. Um, although he he did, I didn't, I don't think we haven't we haven't podcasted since he did this. I don't think I took a video on my phone. I was out at Bob's the other day. Well, I, I drove out there because he's like, "Yeah, tomorrow we're cutting my sawmill in half." I'm like, huh. okay, and I I knew he was doing this. Right. So I have a video, um, and I'll see if Bob will give me permission to post it on the show notes page because it's pretty cool. I slow mode the video. Uh, he has a wood miser that has – the wood miser uh, – most of the wood miser mills is a single post head, so there's only a post on one side. So by slicing the spine of his saw and inserting a milled aluminum block – he now has an extendable head. So he took his sawmill from being able to cut 28 inches between guides to like 42 inches between guides. Oh, wow. With, wow. with three stops in between. So it's like 
if he's cutting a log that's 36 inches and he just wants to cut clear through it, he can just move it to that notch, put a couple bolts in, and put the right size blade on. So, so he's like, yeah, I ordered a bunch of blades um, that were like, I don't remember, they were, they were 190 some inches long. You know, they were they were long because he now has um, 42 inches between guides, which is really nice. Uh, it's nice to have somebody close that has that capacity. Not right. that I, I don't live edge most stuff, but you know, if if somebody's looking for live edge that's a possibility so yeah but it's pretty cool crazy so is this essentially like a riser block you put on a bandsaw does it function yeah, yeah, similarly basically. to that yeah 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 except except in yeah that's a great analogy instead of uh having a base plate that the bolts go through mm-hmm. the riser block goes through the spine okay so you can telescope the head basically so he had, he, had the, he had the world's biggest block of aluminum, and it was really expensive, if I I'm remember sure, right. Yeah. yeah, and he had to have it, you know, brought to a machine shop and milled down and stuff. But I mean, compare it to buying a bigger sawmill, you know, couple, right. you know, couple or thousand having, bucks to having several you know, sawmills, it. you know, just yeah. depending Which on what you're. Seems like a missed opportunity to me, Bob, because <laughs> I know he's listening to this. <laughs> Him and I have talked about buying like a slabbing mill. Um, like a Lucas slabbing mill, which uses a giant chainsaw bar um, with a basically a you know a V6 motor on it. Oh, so it's still a chainsaw mill, but it just is. It's easier. Yeah, um, we've talked about buying one of those. We also I I bought Matt Cremona's bandsaw mill plans, so we've talked about building one also. So it's like. You know, because we have we picked up a few really big logs, like giant elms. Um, he got a couple really big ash and a huge sycamore. Um, but it's like I don't know. Either I haul them somewhere to have them cut, which I've talked to Matt and we've talked about doing some joint videos, Pop Wood and Matt Cremona, on milling some lumber. But that's a you know that's a full weekend of me driving a truck full of tr- logs up there, so. mm-hmm. right? You know, yeah, not ridiculous, but also no. it's a lot of driving time. It is done more ridiculous things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in the last two days. So yeah. <laughs> so going back to Bob's experience coming down, we were also thinking about off camera whether it would be whether there would be interest in people having a, the opportunity to do like a band or a saw milling immersion weekend, yeah. come down, spend some time, you know, do a shop tour here and then spend time out at your place, Logan, mm-hmm. learning about the ins and outs of milling and drying, preparing, working yep. with all of that kind of stuff. So, if you'd be interested in something like that, just put a send us an email or put it in the comments section because I think, you know, that would be something that we could consider doing. So yeah, and we had before COVID started to oh. sell some classes, right? right? Yeah, um, like a weekend class in the shop with one of us teaching it. You know, building a woodsmith or shop notes project or pop wood project. Yeah, um, and we had. Sold quite a few of them, and then COVID hit, and we just kind of we canceled everything, you know, as, as the entire world did. Um, but this kind of falls along those same lines, except it's more of a, as you said, more of like an experience, like a weekend sawmilling primer. Mm-hmm. Where, right. Where, you know, we have a bunch of logs. We got five or six guys coming down, or women, or whoever, uh, coming down, and we're milling logs. We're talking through it. Everybody's running the mill. Um, we load up your vehicle with the lumber you cut. And off you go. Yeah. Um, and I think that would be would be pretty cool. It'd be a, an interesting way to for people to understand what goes into sawmilling, and it would be an interesting thing to be like, hey, I've been thinking about buying a sawmill, but I don't know what goes into it. It's like, well, here you go. Here's the the good, bad, and ugly about it. Right. Yeah. So I think it would also be helpful for. Uh, it's a little behind the scenes, you know, like watch the sausage get made kind of thing. Yeah. There's an element of that, but I think it also would be helpful for people who uh, typically just go to a box store or a lumber yard and you're buying lumber that way. Whereas it gives you the idea that now you can 
look around in your own area for a Logan or a whoever mm-hmm. or a Bob or whatever mm-hmm. and feel confident in knowing like when you go talk to this guy, what he, he or she's gone through to create this lumber in milling it and then how to get the right boards that you want, you know, yeah, yep. to deal with deal with some of the smaller lumber producers that are out there. So, yeah. We could, I think we could even like piggyback something on there with like, you know, uh, afternoon on working with rough lumber. You know, we, Phil, you and I both teach classes for the Des Moines woodworkers. Um, I had one here last night and, you know, we always get emails in the fall and spring, like, Hey, what classes do you guys want to teach? Um, and I've taught this class. <laughs> that was the top, but this splay leg tabletop, this splay leg table class. All right. Um, so this was the one that I taught last night, but I was like, you know what would make a really cool class would be like a working with rough lumber class. Mm-hmm. Like, because there are a lot of people in the Des Moines World Workers that are new. I had a couple of people last night. Uh, one guy um, had a, he had a sawmill. Uh, he had a little woodland sawmill. Um, he had got a bunch of lumber, but doesn't have a joiner. He's never used a joiner. Um, you know, doesn't have a good table saw. Um, I had a lady last night that's like, I've used a circular saw once. So um, it would be an interesting thing to be like, you know, there are some nuances with it. And I actually spent some time filming um, our most recent TV show episode just talking about that. Like rough lumber, here's how you break out parts. Here's how you get them flat and true and square. Um, So I think that'd be interesting too. You know, we could take that on to the saw milling weekend. Like, you know, here's the the good, bad, and ugly of rough lumber. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to do it because... Mm-hmm. You know, working with somebody like you, you can find stuff that you aren't going to find yeah. necessarily. You know, you're going to find sycamore or, you know, basically whatever. Yep. You know, and but then that means the boards that you're getting don't look like the boards you're getting from a lumber yard or from Menards or Home Depot or something like that. So then what? So I think, yeah, that's a good that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of content that can kind of expand outwards from I think even just like you said the the whole act of using a sawmill. I mean, yeah. especially with dress, dressing rough lumber, there's I feel like a lot of notions that could be dispelled about how you know all the different ways you can actually cut up a board too. I mean, you don't. I think again we've talked about this topic many times before about people just kind of especially if you're new to the discipline of woodworking is that you think you have to have Norm Abrams shop to do anything. And that's just not true. And so as a kind of recent convert to track saws, um, I don't know, there's just a lot you can do to break up a piece of lumber um, and it's, it's great and super accessible too. So again, just another area or topic of interest dealing with uh, rough lumber that can be, you know, integrated into whatever sort of hypothetical <laughs> weekend we can saw yeah. milling out at logan's <laughs> yeah yeah so so and while we're on this topic you know talking about hard to find woods like sycamore and stuff so so here's a piece of sycamore right um i i spent a weekend last weekend doing this uh spoil leg table demonstration for the st louis woodworkers guild shout out to the guys down there that was super fun uh had 55 60 people in the room um doing a full day demo on I'm building this table. Part of this class that I like to teach is kind of blending hand tools with power tools. So, you know, I brought down, I had parts all ready for, for getting most of the work done, but I brought down some roughs on lumber. Like, you know, Hey, here's, I happen to have a piece of sycamore. I'm like, Hey, here's a sweet piece of sycamore. You know, this is something you won't find at a local lumber yard or, a, you know, wood spire, but local lumber, lumber yards probably have it. And we were talking about breaking those parts down by hand. Exactly what I had just done on the TV show. So I grab my panel saw and I'm showing guys, you know, how to cross cut, how to rip with a panel saw mm-hmm. and I'm cutting and I'm like, boy, that was a weird spot. Like that thing just was a weird, weird spot in the board. And I said it as I'm standing, I'm standing there ripping this two foot long board with a panel saw. <laughs> and that is what I found in the middle of the board. There was a freaking nail in the board this way. And my, and my panel saw cut through that thing like it was freaking butter. Unbelievable. I, I Oh, yeah? Oh, I just thought, so there was a crack right here that I was ripping off. And it was funny because anybody that 
was at the demo, if, if anybody listens to the show, the, the <laughs> podcast, uh, I said, oh, I'm getting close to that crack. So it's it's binding a little bit because of that crack there. Um, and I mean, wasn't but a stroke to get through it. And I, I hold that board up and I'm like, there's a freaking nail. And I just cut right through it with my handsaw. Unbelievable. So I'm going to send a picture of this to my guy that I got that handsaw from and sharpened it for me. Be like, dude keep it up man like that's awesome <laughs> so i haven't tried to you can cut sheet tried. metal with this thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah hey is your new dust collection ducting too long don't use tin snips use your panel saw use yeah. your panel get the distant okay. out yeah <laughs> uh, but that's part of the bad that's part of the ugly with rough on lumber right, sometimes you never know what's in it nasty surprises yeah yeah but i mean you can also get it's just like yeah because where are you going to find sycamore yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. or you know, like you said, uh, hackberry, some of the yep. local stuff that just isn't going to necessarily get touched. Mm-hmm. You know, because there's ash no... for Kevin Thomas down in Kansas City. Right. Ash. Right. Yep. So, and then we were also talking about because uh, we have the expertise. You know, Chris doing a, a CNC immersion class mm-hmm. where. You come in, get to see what a CNC is like, learn about it, run one of our machines, go home with something that uh, you were involved in producing and have a, have a good idea of whether, A, you want to get a CNC or you have one, but just not sure exactly how to do more than carve your name on a sign kind of a thing. Yep. And Right. So That's a class I would take. Yeah, me too. So. It's good. It's good to have an in-house expert. I know Chris has certainly learned a lot from not only using them, but you know, writing manuals in his spare time. Um, <laughs> I also saw too that he brought in his little 3D printer that he's had for quite some time recently, and he was, yeah. I think, modeling some parts there. Another um, tool that would be a value to have some proficiency in. Again, not that you necessarily have to use it all the time, but again, I kind of like a CNC, just kind of look at it as an extension of the shop. You don't have to do a whole project with it. You could, but again, it's just another way to kind of expand your repertoire. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He made a, he made a little transfer bevel for me. Oh, oh nice. Did, uh, this was one that Ben Strano over at fine woodworking had drawn up and modeled and made on his own 3d printer. Okay. And part of the deal is like, if you think of a typical bevel gauge, you know, you have like a thick handle and a thin blade. Well, you, mm-hmm. it's not real easy to transfer lines from say like a paper pattern or drawings with oh, that because yeah. you have that offset, you know, the blade just yep. doesn't rest on the paper. Whereas this one is totally flat on the bottom. That's cool. So you can line yeah. up that and then take it over to your tool or work piece or whatever. And, transfer the line so uh ben shared the files for that for a 3d printer i can i'll put the link for that in the show notes page Mm -hmm. and then uh chris was trying to get you know just reacquainted with his 3d printer and offered to do that for me so it's a really it's a cool little tool and uh just fun way to use a 3d printer yeah see i i just i feel like if i get down that like slippery bath slippery slope and you get into like three D modeling and stuff, and designing stuff in three D in like SolidWorks and stuff, and then you start making them. It's like that's a hobby I don't freaking need. What you need, <laughs> what you need is a friend with three D printer like Chris, <laughs> and then it's like, oh, hey, can you do this right. for me? <laughs> well, you have a. I noticed you have a. Do you have a laser cutter in your shop? Yeah, there's a yeah there's an X to a laser cutter in here, um, and I'm quickly finding the limitations with it. Um, because I did, um, so this one was, is on loan to us from X tool. It's a Chinese laser company. Um, they, they, they did a big push a couple of months ago to get lasers into, um, influencers hands. And, uh, I told them not an influencer we're a magazine and they're yeah. like, that's cool. It's a different market. So, uh, so we've done some things on it. Um, and I just did a, uh, couple of, so this recent or this, this issue of popular woodworking magazine that I'm working on right now. Um, I did three simple shop projects. So I did a clamp rack, did a turned drill bit index, which is somewhere around here. And then I did a, uh, 
kind of some utility shelves. And they're, I mean, just stupid, simple utility shelves. They're just little butt joint shelves that have trays on top. Um, mm-hmm. One of them's for, like, my push pads. Um, I have one that I keep all my Morris taper, like, live centers and drive centers in at the lathe. Um, and then I have one by my table saw that has, like, a pencil slot and holes and stuff. So I was like, oh, this will be a cool thing just to laser cut these trays, and then you laminate them on top of the Baltic birch. Well, I'm finding that this is a 40, 55 watt laser, I think. Maybe it's 45 watt. Um, hardboard is too dense for this thing to cut. Really? Yes, which is hmm. is interesting to me. It cuts through quarter inch plywood, no issue. Okay. But pressed hardboard, it doesn't? It does not. It's too dense. And something with the resins in there. Oh, oh. I can see that. hold everything together. It just yeah. will. And I... And I thought it was me because, to be to be completely honest, this thing showed up probably from Asia somewhere, and I opened it up, set it up for for photo shoots, and I did not calibrate anything on it. Um, it it worked just fine out of the box. Would it cut through a little bit better if I go through and calibrate all the laser or all the laser and all the, the uh, mirrors and stuff? Probably. Um, yeah. Would it get through it? I don't know. I did a quick search on the X Tool um, Facebook page, and a lot of people said the same thing: like you mm-hmm. cannot get through quarter inch hardboard. Um, so it just was. It was one of those like, oh, I didn't realize this was going to be that big of an issue. Yeah. Um, acrylic plexiglass cuts beautifully. Um, I made mm-hmm. a drill or I made a index wheel for the lathe using it. Um, just out of a 12 by 12 piece of acrylic and it laser cut through that thing without an issue. Crazy. Um, yeah. So it, you know, it, so yes, Dylan, Tate, that was long winded answer to your question. Yes, there is a laser right. cutter sitting here. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm slowly seeing where you could use it in the shop, but I'm, I'm also seeing where there's some pretty big limitations for it. Yeah. Like this clamp rack, um, I have parts to make another clamp rack for all my F style clamps, which are currently <laughs> laying in a pile on the floor. Um, and I'm like, well, I have it sure be nice just to be able to put that thing in there and laser cut all those little notches out instead of standing up with them on the table saw and stuff, you know, whatever. Um, but a half inch plywood, it would, it would, it would do it in multiple passes, but those edges are going to be pretty scorched. Yeah. So, you know, but, yeah, well, and we've had that uh, laser pecker in the office here too, which isn't a hey, that's a sweet a cutter one, per yeah. se, but it's an engraver. Yeah, yeah. which has been kind of cool on what you can do with that too. Yeah, something like that is almost for the space it takes up because that's a little guy. It is yeah, small. the space it tapes up takes up, and if you're engraving with it, that's almost a better bang for the buck than a big unit. Yeah, well, that's that's true because you're not really reduced to the platform that comes on. It has rollers yeah. that you can do longer pieces on, which is super clever. I haven't used yeah. that function, but Chris has, and um, I know he was playing around with uh, hardwood, uh, plywood, and then some, I think, some plexi, and then I actually did a little bit of engraving on leather, and it just works fantastic. Yep. Um, really, you just have to mess around with tight face, you know, dial in the intensity of the laser and it does a, does a really, really nice job. And like you said, Logan, it just takes up such a small footprint. So, you know, yeah. make multiples of whatever you're doing or one thing, and then you can just tuck it away. I think I have it on my shelf in my office right now. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and my, my buddy Greg had bought one. Um, I don't remember which, I know there's a bunch of different laser peckers ones available. He had bought yeah. one um, several months before we got the one in the office and he was running off his phone, and he bought it just to uh, engrave his signature on the bottom of bowls, which was really – I mean, it's slick. Hmm. You you have it – if you have a bowl vacuum chucked to the lathe, you just stand that thing up. Yeah. And it just bzzz, does the bottom of a bowl. I'm like, yeah, you can You can actually just hold it up to items too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's got a – it has, has a platform, but you can actually just use it as a handheld laser engraver too, which is pretty cool. Yeah. There's – um. There are, with the bigger units like these, so this is like the third or fourth laser that I've messed around with. Um, I, had a, I had one at the print shop, God, probably 10 years ago, that was a import from Taiwan or something like that. Um, and the guy I got it from for the print shop, 
he had went through and like redid a lot of the electronics and the guy was an electrical engineer. So he went through and kind of redid some stuff inside of it to kind of shore it up um, because it was a cheap import. Um, and I use that quite a bit. Um, the biggest thing that I have found with these bigger units like this, like this X tool, um, you know, the Glowforge to some degree, um, the epilogues um, is the interface that you're using on your computer. Um, that kind of becomes the limiting factor. Like, it's not like a CNC where you can you basically have free reign over it. Um, you're stuck within the parameters of the program you're using. Um, but with that said, that can be a really nice tool because, uh, like the X tool, for example, they have a function in there that is a um, a testing function. So it is a scatter of a uh, hundred squares, and you can put your material in there. And let it do, it will give you, it will do, you know, the first square will be 5% power at 100 speed. The next one will be 10% power at 100 speed. And it will give you this scatter of engraving or cutting so you can test your material first before mm -hmm. oh, engraving or cool. cutting and stuff. So you know exactly what settings you need to get the look you want. Wait, wait, so, you know, some of that's kind of cool. Um, it's just a different, it's a different way to look at it. Um, and, of course... You know the X tool, the the Glowforge, the uh, some of the epilogues to some degree. They're they're home, they are home hobby lasers. So they're not a engraving metal or cutting metal. That's not what these are. Um, mm -hmm. They make them, but they're industrial size. Um, you can engrave some metal with uh, a spray, um, an engraving spray. But you know when you start to get into the bigger hundred watt lasers, that's when you get into like. I can cut through three quarter inch MDF really easily. So mm -hmm. I can, at that point, it's almost a CNC with a, you know, half a millimeter kerf. Right. So, yeah. But all this just from suggesting that Chris do a CNC immersion weekend class. Yeah. So, well, and there's now, content there. Yeah. yeah. And, and you can attach the lasers to CNC machines now. So, yeah. 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 Which I think Chris is actually looking to see what options are available for attaching a laser to the shop notes CNC plan. Hmm. Oh, so, I thought you were going to say to a shark. I'm pretty sure Dr. Evil did that already. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, he did that. Yeah. yeah. So. But he didn't patent it, so we're going to try and no, do that's that. True. That's true. <laughs> he, he probably would have patented it for a million dollars. Yep. Yep. So there you go. All right. Yep. I think that wraps up another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. Special thanks to Tight Bond Glue for sponsoring these broadcasts. Uh, they're the glue that we use in the shop all the time. All the time. I can see a dozen <laughs> Tight Bond Glue bottles from where I sit right here. So a dozen and one. Oh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of actually looks like the Titebond factory around here. <laughs> <laughs> so they just have all kinds of glues that uh, we use to match every style of woodworking and personality. Some of us are kind of the slow set liquid hide glue kind of people, and some people need speed set. So if you're looking for a glue, Titebond has one for you. Check it out, tightbond.com. If you have any questions, comments, or smart remarks, you can email them woodsmith at woodsmith.com or leave them as a comment on our YouTube page. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye.